This, my friends, is the Sony a7C. This is kind of a curious camera that Sony's brought out recently, and C stands for compact, but it does have some similarities and some differences, actually, between the bigger a7 III, which is kind of the less compact version of this camera, on paper anyways. But in this video, we're gonna talk about this camera, some of the similarities, some of the differences between the a7 III, the a7C, and even the a6600 to help you decide which one, if any, you should be considering. Let's get started. Welcome back guys, and yes, today we're checking out the A7C. This little guy, which is a compact, basically, A7 III on paper, and this is the kit lens that it comes with. It's a 28 to 60 f4 to 5.6, a curious little lens that pretty much nobody in their right mind would ever use if you're serious about photography or filmmaking. It is very small to kind of go with the theme of the camera, but it's a kit lens and it acts and performs just like a kit lens. So although it is small, you actually even have to turn it to 28 to engage it. You can't just start up your camera and start snapping. It will say, please extend to 28, which is kind of a nightmare in, in, if you ask me. So that's what it really, what it looks like. And like I said, this, this kit lens for me is just kind of a weird, I don't know about it, but if you do want to see a review on it anyways, I'll link it up there for you, for you to check out. But today we're concentrating on the Sony a7C. C means compact, of course, and if you have any lenses that are worth anything, they're going to be decently sized and decently heavy, making this camera, well, not really that compact. Here's the Sigma 24 to 70 on there, and this is a film tailored camera with a lot of video specs that some people might be looking for. So most likely you're gonna have something bigger and heavier on here. So the compactness of it is a little bit strange when you look at the a7 III. It does have an EVF in the center opposed to a little one here in the corner, which we'll get into, but it's really not that much smaller. So today we're gonna to talk about the a7C versus the a7 III and even the a6600 like I mentioned and try and help you decide which one you should be considering and uh, maybe talk about some things that you haven't thought of yet. If you haven't seen one of my videos, my name's Stefan Malik and I do a lot of photography and filmmaking news reviews and tutorials. So if you do enjoy this type of content and you like this video, consider hitting that like and subscribe button and join the community. So let's dive right in and talk about the form factor and the build of this camera. Now it does have some upgrades, but it does have some things that I do not like compared to say the a7 III. So if you want the ultimate compact camera for video shooting, and you're on a budget, this might be a great option. It's nowhere compared to, say, the a7S III in terms of video, that's in another universe. If you're serious about video and you're comparing the two, they, they, they're not comparable. Just go for the a7S III, it's an absolute beast for video. Now, having said that, who's this camera for then? What about photography? I wanna clear the air and say that if you are a photographer first primarily, that's your passion, I do not recommend this camera to you at all absolutely pick up the a7 III. In fact, right now it's $300 off, the cheapest it's ever been. Go buy it, don't think twice. And I'm gonna tell you why. Form factor is really important when it comes to photography. It has to be intuitive. And ultimately the reality is that this thing, although it feels better than let's say the a6600 or the, the little crop sensor cameras, it's just, there's things missing. Now the grip is small. And for one thing, there's no front dial. And that drives me insane. I want a front dial and I want a joystick and there's no joystick there either. So picking your autofocus points is very slow and it's just, it's not a very intuitive camera, I must say. So there are a few things about the form factor that kind of bug me. There's some great upgrades, but mainly, well, the, the dial there, huge miss. The joystick there, huge miss. And the worst part of this camera by far for me is the EVF. This thing is horrid. It's absolutely horrible. It's not an upgrade in resolution in anything. It's tiny, it's in the corner, it's awkward. If you're shooting in the day, it's even hard to see the, the LCD screen. The EVF and the LCD are definitely this camera's weakest point. Okay, and I'm gonna get the bad stuff out of the way first because there are a lot of great aspects to this camera, don't worry. But for 
photography, there's also no custom buttons. So switching to things quickly, switching your modes, getting to the settings that you need, this thing is not exactly fast. So for me, photography, I hope that settles it. Go for the a7 III, period. So let's talk about a few things on the body that are actually pretty good. And one of these things is the upgrade when it comes to weather sealing. Of course, they've done a great job at finally looking and making this thing a bit more confident when it comes to weather sealing. These little flappy door things here, but they're, it's not perfect, I must say, because the, one of the other aspects of this camera that I do kind of enjoy is the flip screen. Right, we finally got our flip screen on a full frame camera. Now, I was a huge advocate for this, but I must say the thing kind of bugs me sometimes. And I find maybe it's just because I'm so used to shooting with the a7 III. When I look down or if I'm filming in video, I just want to tilt it up or down. And I find myself going, oh geez, I have to actually pull this thing out and, and then kind of do a flip. So. Again, coming from a Canon, it was a no brainer. I loved it. Now, maybe using the a7 III for so long, maybe, man, there's a lot of first world problems going on, isn't there? Ultimately, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it's not perfect. Like I said, those doors here, these little flaps that are improved for weather sealing and whatnot, if you are hooked up to an external monitor or your headphone jack up here, um, well, I have some bad news. If you wanna bring out your basically your little screen like that, it's hitting the door. So it's not perfect by any means. You can't actually flip that. So if you wanna see in front of you, you have to be careful. And if there's something connected there, well, you're gonna run into some issues. So again, nothing's perfect, but I thought I'd enjoy the flip screen a little bit more than I do, um, but I find it a little bit burdensome maybe. And again, first world problems, but uh, yeah, that's just kind of how I'm feeling right now. As far as the controls go, the AF on button is in a great spot right there. It has what it needs. You know, it's got its exposure compensation dial over here and whatnot, but it's just missing some of the things that I'm really looking for to make me comfortable, if you will. So keep that in mind when it comes to form factor. The overall size is decent. It does feel very similar, maybe a little bit better built than the A6600, but uh, also very similar. When it comes to image quality, it's literally the exact same sensor as the Sony a7 III. Nothing new here. There might be a little bit of change in color science, nothing too incredible, but as far as the low light performance, the sharpness, the megapixels, all that stuff that we're used to, it's nothing new. But again, it's a great performing sensor. Here's a few shots that I did take with this camera, and this is using the kit lens, the 28 to 60. And if you're curious, here's what that focal length looks like here at 28 millimeters and here at 60. And here's a few photos that I took using my Sigma 24 to 70. Another downside of this camera and something that rules it out for me for professional work is unfortunately the absence of a second memory card slot. And this is a UHS-2, which means it's gonna do great to keep up with your big buffer and whatnot. It also has a great Z-Type battery, which is phenomenal. In fact, it's the best battery performance out of any Sony full-frame mirrorless camera, period. It's incredible. It's approaching near DSLR battery capabilities. So the Z-Type battery is a huge win and uh, something I love to see in every camera moving forward. If you're an old Sony user, unfortunately, it's got the same old menu system that we're used to. It doesn't have the new menu system that's found in the Sony a7S III. And unfortunately, we're also not able to use our touchscreen in the menu. It's only gonna be for our autofocus selection. And uh, honestly, it's really not that great. So definitely a few oversights, but let's talk about some of the decent features of this camera. One is the autofocus. The active tracking is just phenomenal. It's great and I love it and I wish that the a7 III had it and I am so incredibly excited for the a7 IV and whatever that entails. Just some upgrades, putting everything into the definitely, as far as I'm concerned, the best selling mirrorless camera of 2021, fingers crossed. So active track is a great feature and it's great for stills. Although, like I said, I don't recommend it for photography too, too much, but in video, it's 
a rock star. It's got eye autofocus in video, up to 4K 24 frames per second. It's got your 120 at 1080, but unfortunately no 4K 60. And I think that would have been one of the major things that put this camera into the next level. But as far as autofocus is concerned in general, there's really nothing, if you ask me, that comes close to an entry level full frame camera with this autofocus capabilities. So do keep that in mind. Your 4K 30 still has the same 17% crop as the Sony a7 III. And one great thing about video is that they've actually taken out the 30 minute recording time limit on the a7C. So again, this is a video tailored camera. So if you're needing to do interviews or any long recordings, well, that's not gonna be a problem for you. Yes, the Sony a7 III does have five axis image stabilization, just like the a7 III, but it's not quite as good. However, it does have gyro data. And what that means is you can bring your footage into Sony's, basically their own program for editing, which is super inconvenient if you ask me, and take all the data that this records to help you stabilize your footage. It's essentially using the data to crop your image to a point where it's nice and stable. However, that just seems crazy to me because if you want to use your gyro data, first of all, your IBIS has to be off. And in Premiere Pro or something like that, we can just use Warp Stabilizer and pretty much end up with the same effect. So I will throw another video up comparing the differences between the gyro data, for example, and what a Warp Stabilizer would do and see the difference between those. But uh, honestly, it's not really that big of a deal. It doesn't have active stabilization like the A7S three does, but it does have the ability to track it, which is promising for the future. Okay, so who's this camera for? Why would you buy this over the a6600, which is cheaper with a lot of the same features, or why not just buy the a7 III? Well, if you're a creator online like me and you're getting in and only shoot video, that's really the only thing that you're gonna do. You're not worried about photography or the convenience or the ergonomics of a nice photography camera, well then I might suggest this to you. It's got great autofocus, especially in video. It's got all your picture profiles that you're looking for. It's got the gyro data if that's important for you. It's a good little camera for a gimbal. It's gonna be better on a gimbal than the a7 III because it is more compact and smaller, not by much, but uh, yeah, it's got that going for it. It's a little bit better than the a7 III in a few aspects and not as good in several more for me. If you had to ask me to pick one between the new a7C and the a7 III, there's no competition. For me personally, I love my a7 III and I'd buy it again in a heartbeat, especially at the newer lower price. But really it's gonna be up to you and what your needs are. The a6600 is a great alternative. It's pretty much the same size, just a crop body lens. It's got pretty much the same autofocus with not quite as many little bells and whistles when it comes to video, but it's very comparable. They all have the same Z-Type battery. And uh, yeah, it's just about kind of figuring out which one's gonna be better for you. For me, until they drop the a7 IV, it's gonna be the a7 III for me still, but I wanna hear what you think about this camera. Which one are you leaning towards? Which one's better for you personally? Drop that stuff down in the comments and uh, let me know. Anyways, guys, let's leave it at that. I hope this video was eye-opening for you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if, again, if you have any comments or questions or if I got something wrong, make sure you tell me about it down there. If you're ready to pull the trigger on this camera or perhaps the a7 III, I'll leave an affiliate link down below for you to pick it up. And uh, like always, make mistakes, be yourself, and get out there and take some more pictures. See you next time. Whoa. Woo. That's sketchy.